Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Miller, for uh, five minutes. Gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman for yielding, and Mr. Speaker, I too rise in support of victory in Iraq and in support of our troops. But I also rise to oppose this democratic defeatist resolution, and I hope to provide some historical perspective to help the American people understand what the Democrats plan to do this year. Make no mistake about it, this resolution is about polls. National polling before November's election showed a majority of Americans were opposed to cutting off funds for the war, but were generally unhappy with events on the ground. Now, this polling data led the Democratic message machine to create a we support the troops, don't support the war, but won't cut off funding position. Much like Majority Leader Hoyer's empty promises to allow a Republican alternative uh, to this defeatist resolution, the Democrats are now following polls and slowly, piece by piece, bit by bit, revising their stance on defunding the war. Due to their majority status, this resolution will pass, and soon after the passage, I suspect that Congressman Murtha and others will move to defund the war the same way the Democratic-controlled Congress defunded the Vietnam War over a several-year period. They will do so in a piecemeal fashion with various amendments to appropriation bills, always avoiding the term defunding at all cost. Before we've even concluded this debate, our speaker has already said a vote of disapproval will set the stage for additional Iraq legislation, which will be coming to the House floor. I ask our speaker, what is your additional Iraq legislation? The only difference between what the Democrats will soon attempt to do and what they did in the late 60s and early 70s is that they will continue to say publicly that they support the troops instead of speaking as Senator Kerry did in front of a congressional committee of the atrocities of the so-called baby killers. The poisonous atmosphere of those times resulted in the military prohibiting that all military personnel in the metropolitan Washington area were prohibited from wearing their uniforms in public out of safety concerns. Now, two of the most crippling amendments of the Vietnam War were passed in 1969 and 1973. In 69, Senator John Sherman Cooper of Kentucky co-sponsored an amendment prohibiting the use of ground troops in Laos and Thailand. In August of 1973, the Congress passed the Fulbright-Aiken Amendment, which cut off all funding for U.S. military forces in or over or from the shore of North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Laos, or Cambodia. President Nixon's approval ratings in 73 were dismally low, and he was close to resigning as a result of the Watergate scandal. And his weakened position emboldened the Democrats to take extreme actions. I would say that some of their actions may have bordered on treasonous, but they have never been judicially challenged. Our current president has an approval rating nearly as low, and now, as they did then, Democrats are feeling emboldened to challenge our, Democrat, or our commander in chief during a time of war specifically for political gain. It has also been said that this non-binding resolution will not affect troop morale. If so, why not amend this non-binding resolution to send a copy to every man and woman fighting in Iraq, along with a rec record of each vote? Well, that's right. We don't get a chance to have any amendments. What is important here are the President's words and his actions. He's ordered more combat forces to Iraq, he has extended the tours of some forces already in country. Let's be perfectly clear. 14 of the 18 provinces in Iraq are secure. These additional forces will help restore overall order and provide a stable environment for the political process from within which to work. Now, I can assure all of my constituents that the recent developments in Iraq will result in a quick or certain victory in Iraq. But I can assure my constituents and my colleagues that Democrats cannot say with absolute certainty that there is no military solution to the war in Iraq. I must also point out several other recent Democratic statements that I take issue with, like the one from over this weekend, where a senator with presidential ambitions said that more than 3,000 lives were wasted. Of course, he clarified his remarks because he forgot about the secret Democratic memo that this isn't the 70s anymore and trashing the military is no longer uh, acceptable. It reminds me of a former presidential candidate who said that uh, those that joined our army uh, were only stupid people. Of course, after the polls came in, uh, he clarified his remarks because he saw they weren't being taken very well. Back to the polls. 
Only 15 percent of the public expressed initial support for the first President Bush to invade Iraq in 1991. Many in my own Republican Party vehemently opposed FDR in World War II, and during the Civil War there was a congressional committee that met officially and unofficially on a regular basis to critique President Lincoln's performance in nearly every battle the Union waged. Does history now reflect these? And I ask that the uh, rest of my comments be inserted into the record. Without objection.